Hey, what's up guys? Thank you for tuning in today. For our guest, I want to extend a special thank you for you tuning in as well. We miss you guys dearly, and I am uh, so looking forward to the time we get to meet together in person. I feel like it's going to be soon. I don't think there's been a definite date set as of uh, the day of this recording, but uh, hopefully soon, next couple weeks sometime, and uh, we're planning what that's going to look like. Uh, we're planning that out. Uh, whether it's going to be uh, kind of in smaller groups, two services, you know, maybe 50% capacity in the church. We don't know yet, but we're, we're looking into different things. Uh, and uh, I want you to know, too, going forward over the next few weeks, we will still uh, be recording the sermons. And, and it may switch over to a live feed. We're working, out through, uh, working some of those details out. But just know, we miss you guys and we're praying for you. Uh, speaking of prayer, I want to thank you for joining us and fasting and praying for our nation, for our current situation this last Friday, and for all who tuned in to our daily devotionals this past week. Thank you as well. Uh, we're going to keep that going over the next few weeks. Uh, so we'll be in Acts chapter 2 today. We're going to rewind just a bit, and we're going to look at uh, Peter's sermon. We're going to kind of break down the contents of his sermon and really talk about the gospel. Uh, now next week, you're not going to want to miss next week because we have a special guest our Galveston Baptist Association mission, uh, mission director is going to be here, Dr. Jim Grant. We're going to be talking about missions and, uh, and just some of the changes that have been brought into the church through COVID-19 and, and just through this situation of lockdowns and, and what does it look like going forward. It's going to be a great conversation, so you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, but really today, we have just an incredible story to talk about in Acts chapter 2. So why don't we go ahead and pray. Bow with me, if you will, and we're going to pray as we open up. Father, I thank you, God, for this time together. For all who are listening now, I pray, God, as we dive into the scriptures, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts from the word. Feed us, God, because, Lord, your word is meat. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, too. Lord, when you speak, you create things. You sustain worlds. Your word is powerful. So, God, I pray that you would use your word to talk to us today. And, God, I pray as we go through talking about the gospel, we go through this sermon that Peter preached I pray that you would touch someone's heart and lead them to put faith in you if they've never done so before in their life. And we pray all this in your name, trusting you. Amen. Hey, thank you guys again for joining me. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14, and we're going to work through this text. Uh, but before we do, I, I have to tell you just a quick story. Um, I had, a couple years ago, a small glimpse of what I feel like heaven would be like. And, and let me explain. We were in Israel... We decided to tour the country. We ended up in northern Israel on the Sea of Galilee. And I have to tell you, I just couldn't believe I was there. It was the first time I'd been to the Sea of Galilee. I grew up on a lake. This was about the size of the same lake I grew up on. And uh, to actually see people jet skiing, fishing, and, and riding boats you know, in, the lake, uh, in the Sea of Galilee was kind of funny. Uh, because I just imagined Jesus walking on the water and now there's people jet skiing on it. But we were in Tiberias, which is on the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's a beautiful city. We were uh, staying the night there. We went out to eat. And then on uh, Saturday, on Sabbath, we had gone to a church to worship there in uh, Tiberias. And, and I don't remember the name of it. It might have been First Baptist Tiberias or Tiberias Community Church. But I remember going there with a bunch of other Christians. Now, there were Christians from all walks of life in this, in this building in Tiberias. Uh, there were uh, Jews and Arabs. And there were Germans and French and there were uh, Taiwanese people there who had come to Israel to work the farms. There were e English-speaking people from England, Australia, and, and the Americas. And uh, we had all gathered in there. It was about 350 to 400 of us in this, in this church. And, and we came for the main service, kicked off at 1030. And it felt very much like a Western American church. But I remember we walked in. People greeted us, handed us uh, cards, you know, welcome cards, and we got set down. We were in our, in our little small archaeological group. That's what I was there for. And, and I remember when the first song hit, the words came up on the screen, and I, I just froze as I looked at the words on the screen. Uh, and this was probably back in 2006, 2008. And I remember looking up at the words on the screen, and there was the words of a song that I knew very well. At the time, it was a popular Chris Tomlin song. And as the band began playing, uh, everybody was singing the same song. But the thing was, on the screen, it was written in different languages. There was uh, English and Hebrew and Arabic and French and German and Taiwanese language. They were all there on the screen. We were all singing this song together, uh, worshiping God. And everybody was singing kind of in their own language. And it was a fantastic experience. 
I remember taking it in, soaking it in, having, hearing everybody worship God together. Different cultures, different backgrounds. We had people from all walks of life, from every continent represented in that church. And we were worshiping Jesus Christ. And it was an amazing experience. And I remember thinking as I sat there, this is probably what heaven's going to be like. Minus the fact that I was tired. But it was an amazing experience, just worshiping God. And in a similar fashion, that's what's going on here in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. Now today, we are 14 days after the resurrection, after the Passover. So they're about eh, you know, 30 or so days, 35 days or so from where we are today. But they're going into Jerusalem. They're worshiping there in Pentecost. And there's people from all walks of life. You have uh, people from Rome and Crete and Arabia and, and even further up into Asia from some of the other little areas around Egypt. And they're all speaking different languages. They're from different cultures. They probably have different dress codes and different skin color and, and little accents. And they're all in there together. They're worshiping God on the day of Pentecost. And that's when the Spirit falls down on them. If you will remember, back early in chapter 2, the Spirit came down, filled the apostles with the, the Spirit, those, those flaming tongues resting on them. They began speaking in the known languages for, to all the people there, proclaiming the miraculous acts of God. And then the people are perplexed, saying, what, what in the world's going on here? And that's when Peter jumps up to take his chance to, to preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that's exactly what's going on. There's a bunch of different people speaking a bunch of different languages from all different types of background, but they are hearing the greatest story ever told. Now let's look at what this story is. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 14. So you can follow along as you read. There's, there's a lot of, lot of text here, so just follow along. But he says in verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now I'm going to pause here and we're going to continue in just a minute. Let me give you a little background. Remember, if you will, as the, the Spirit filled the apostles, they went out and began proclaiming in everybody's different language, the miraculous acts of God. And this was a supernatural event. <laughs> and, and everybody's hearing this and they're in awe and they're, they're in wonder of what's going on. And, but some people were mocking them, as it says back in verse uh, 12. Some people said they're drunk. And so here Peter takes this chance to kind of clarify that and says, hey, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. Let me explain what's going on. And then he's going to explain in full detail. He's going to use the Old Testament to explain that. But before we get there, look in verse 14. What happens is everybody comes and asks this question. What in the world's going on? Peter stands up and the other guys stand with him, the 11, and he raises his voice and he proclaims to them. He proclaims something to them. He proclaims the greatest story ever told. So the first thing we see here is Peter's proclamation. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but Peter's taken the chance. He's taken the opportunity to proclaim the good news to, uh, to his fellow Jews, to those who are listening to him. And friends, I'm sure that even, even in a COVID-19 world where we're in lockdown and we have to stand six feet apart, there are still chances and opportunities to proclaim the good news probably on a daily basis. I, I know for a fact. But Peter takes this chance and he's going to proclaim the greatest story ever told. He's going to explain it to them in full detail. Now, I uh, have been really encouraged just even the last two weeks. I have to say I've heard some stories of people proclaiming the good news. Uh, I've had, uh, in fact, I'm going to brag on Steve in just a minute. A couple weeks ago he said that he got a, a chance to visit with someone and share the gospel with this man, and he put faith in Christ. Uh, another young man in our church had, had shared the gospel with his sister and brother-in-law and, and his uncle and a couple other friends. Um, personally, I've been able to do the same. In fact, just this past week I've given out three Bibles while sharing the gospel. One of those was the comic book Bible and, uh, and, and was able to give that to a close friend of mine. Uh, hey, whatever works, right? The, I never thought I would give the comic book Bible out. But you know what? It's where uh, I get all my sermons from if Eric is not writing them. So anyways, um, I personally have been sharing the gospel too. And I hope you have too. I've been taking every chance possible to proclaim the good news. People are a little bit more respect, receptive now or probably a little bit more uh, open to, to listening to what you have to say during this time of, of crisis, during this pandemic. But Peter stands up and he makes this proclamation. And he says, guys, listen, let me explain to you. We're not drunk, but let me explain what's going on here. And he jumps right into the scriptures. 
Now, you have to remember, up to this time, uh, this is early in the church's history, they didn't have the New Testament written just yet. They were going off the Old Testament. And it wasn't like the Old Testament was readily available. They probably had uh, most of the Old Testament in the local synagogues. And I'm sure here in Jerusalem, they had copies of the scrolls. It was in scroll form. But they couldn't just pull out their iPhone, go to their Bible app, go to a specific text, uh, like we can today. We, have a, we are so blessed, guys, that we can do this. Uh, this is amazing. In fact, just this last week, I was on the phone with a friend from Iran sharing the gospel with him. I just couldn't believe it. I was video chatting with him, sharing the gospel with him. I, I thought, this is amazing. I was able to pull up the scriptures in his own language. So here, uh, Peter is referring back to the Old Testament in scroll form. Now, he probably has a lot of this memorized. Uh, he probably has studied it for a long period of time. He might even have a scroll with him. But I, I feel like under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's probably calling it to memory. But what's happening here is he is going to share Jesus with this crowd from the Old Testament. And, and that's one thing I want to reiterate. And we've talked a lot about this. In fact, we had a whole Sunday night series on uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, all the Old Testament points to the coming of Christ. It's all about him. And we're seeing that fulfilled here. And, and some of those other prophecies we're seeing fulfilled here in the book of Acts. But he goes back and he says, let me explain what's going on here. And he goes all the way back to Joel and he says, the Lord spoke uh, through the prophet Joel about what you're seeing, about this, this, uh, this speaking in tongues, this proclamation of the good news. And he says, and it will be, uh, starting there in, uh, in verse 17, and it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. And, and he's saying this is literally being fulfilled right now. That's what Peter says. We're in the last days, and this is literally being fulfilled right here in Acts chapter 2. Jesus said it. He promised the coming of the Spirit. All the way back in Joel's day, the prophet Joel, years before this event, he predicted the same thing, that God's Spirit would come down and fill believers. And, and amazing things would happen. So he's, he's pouring his Spirit out on all the people. Praise God for that. He says, then your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and the cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is amazing. Here's Peter, hundreds of years after Joel wrote. And he fills, gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he recalls the text from Joel chapter 2, towards the end there, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and following. And he, and he quotes this scripture from Joel as, uh, as it's literally being fulfilled. And God knows what he's doing, friends. He's, he's had a plan always from the time of Adam and Eve to Joel all the way to Peter all the way until right now. God has had a plan. And, and here Peter says this is being fulfilled. What's being fulfilled? The Spirit coming down and filling people and, and miraculous things happening. And people calling on the name of the Lord and getting saved. Uh, which is an amazing miracle, by the way. Then he kind of explains it in verse 22. He says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, uh, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it is not possible for him to be held by death. So, so what we have here is Peter first takes this, this moment for this proclamation. He begins preaching the first sermon. And then he gives this explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, the Spirit has filled us. We're proclaiming the miraculous acts of God. And then he says, and let me go a step further and talk to you about Jesus of Nazareth. The most important human figure that has ever walked the earth. And uh, he says, this is the way it happened. He was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs. And we see that written in the New Testament. You go back to Luke, the same author that wrote Acts, and you'll read those miracles, signs, those wonders. And it says that though, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, he used lawless men to nail him to a cross and kill him. So Peter is going to share the gospel. He's going to give this explanation of what's happened to them, this explanation for their joy, this explanation of the gospel, the good news. He's going to tell the most important story ever told. 
Hey, listen, I don't know if you're like me. I love a good story. I, I love a really good uh, movie. Uh, I love a really good book. In fact, just this past week, I was watching a movie uh, with the boys. It was uh, some cartoon, but the story was good enough that I got involved in it, and I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to study and read. Instead, I wanted to watch the movie. That's how drawn into stories that I am. Uh, and, and I love when people come up and tell me stories about their life, or uh, war stories, or stories about their marriage, or whatever it is. I, I just love hearing stories. And here, friends, uh, is the greatest story you'll ever be told. And that's what Peter's explaining to them. He says, first off, Jesus, although it was God's determined plan, um, and God used his foreknowledge to, to bring these people against him, he said they killed him. Jesus laid down his life for us. He, he died. We celebrated that two weeks ago on Good Friday. He died, he was buried, and then verse 24, Peter explains the full gospel. He says, but God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. So Peter takes this amazing opportunity to share the gospel. He says, Jesus died, was buried, and guess what? He rose from the dead. That's the gospel message. Two weeks ago on Easter, we talked about that. We talked about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says the same. He says, hey, you know the gospel I've delivered to you? That Jesus walked the earth perfectly? He was perfect. He died, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's the gospel message. And here Peter shares that same story. And then he goes back and he talks a little bit more about the Old Testament. He uses some Old Testament scriptures to kind of explain the situation. Now you have to remember he's talking to Jewish people. And, and, and they're probably pretty religious. It's probably a pretty religious crowd. Uh, they're there celebrating Pentecost. So they know the Old Testament. They know the stories, the prophecies. They know the, the Messianic prophecies. So he goes back to that and he says, For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. Uh, you fill me with gladness in your presence. And he's quoting from the book of Psalms here. He's quoting from uh, Psalm 16 specifically, starting at about verse 8 and following. And he's using David's words that were written around 850, 900 B.C., 900 years before Christ came. He's using those words uh, as a, and, it's, and it's showing that it's being fulfilled right here in Jesus Christ. And he says, David kind of has this vision. You know, it's kind of like when you're driving uh, into a mountain range. The land is really flat, and you look in the distance, the mountains look like it's one line of mountains. But the closer you get the more depth the mountains have. And that's kind of what's going on here is David probably sees the Messiah from a distance. And, and once you get there, it kind of has this fulfillment. And he says, uh, hey, my heart is glad. Uh, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to Hades. And he's talking about proof for the resurrection. And he says, uh, you will not allow your Holy One, the Messiah, to see decay. You have revealed to me the paths of life to me. And so in Psalm 16, uh, David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking about a future figure that's going to have some type of resurrection. And here Peter says, this is being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's amazing uh, how God has worked all this together, right? It's almost like he has a, has a, has a complete plan is in, and is in control. But Peter uses this text to show that the resurrection is important. And then he says in verse 29, Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried and in his tomb... Uh, with us to this day. Peter's talking to this crowd in Jerusalem, and he says, guys, remember, David wrote Psalm 16 here that I just quoted to you, but guess what? He's dead. He hasn't risen from the dead. In fact, his tomb is like right over there in Jerusalem. His tomb is still there. He said, you can go there and you can see all the dead people, David and his son and everybody else, right? Absalom and Solomon, all those people. They're all buried and dead. And so he points that out here. He says, he is both dead and buried and in his tomb with us today. Verse 30, since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. So he is talking about, um, he's using the Old Testament scriptures to point to Jesus Christ. That's really what he's doing. He's kind of giving this explanation to the people too. And he says, guys, here's the good news, man. As the Messiah came, even though he died, I've got some even better news for you. Not only did he die for you, uh, he was buried, but he rose from the dead. And that, my friends, is probably uh, the most important part of uh, the gospel message because it means we don't stay dead. But he's explaining to them what's going on. Then verse 32, he says, God has raised 
this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. And you can imagine the crowd. A lot of these people would have been there during Passover. A very large amount of them would have been. They would have probably have heard or have seen or, or experienced the, the death of, of, of Christ on the cross or, or at least have been there probably or, or have seen it, heard about what was going on. And here Peter's given this explanation. He says, remember Jesus died, but God has raised him up. We are all witnesses of this. All these people up here, all 11 of us and more. Verse 33, therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Peter is just giving a literal explanation for what's going on. Remember back in Joel, man, God said he would pour out his spirit. Remember what David said, God would raise the Messiah up from, from the dead. Uh, and, and we're here celebrating that. We're alive, we're filled with the spirit, we're excited because of what God has done. He said, for it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself who says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So he says, hey, Jesus has resurrected. He's at the right hand of God, and God is currently making his enemies uh, his footstool. He's putting them under him, and, and he's giving them victory. He's had victory over sin and death, and it's going to continue until the end times. So he uses this, this Old Testament scripture to explain the good news. And then in verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Bam, there's the proclamation. He, he, gives this, he starts off with the pro proclamation. He gives the full explanation of the gospel. And at the end, he says, guys, I want to proclaim to you the truth, and that is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. And, and so for Peter to say that is a very loud statement. Uh, it is a very powerful statement to say that Jesus was the Messiah. The, the whole Jewish population... Just about all of them were looking forward to the days of the Messiah. Things were, were uh, politically unrestful there in that time. And, and so they're waiting for the Messiah. In fact, we'll find out a little later on that there have already been a few people come along and claim to be the Messiah or claim to be some great leader and it dies out. And so here, Peter, for him to get up and say that Jesus was the Lord and the Messiah, it's a powerful and dangerous claim. And so, but he does it. He tells the truth. Uh, because it is true. Jesus is Lord, and he is the Messiah. And I think that there's, in our culture today, we've kind of lost this idea of what it means to have something, uh, a, a Lord over us. Uh, and, and I always go back to my kids. I think about my kids. Not that I'm Lord over them, but I am over their care, their protection, their provision. And, and I get onto them when they do something wrong. If they run out to the street, I, I yell at them to come back. And I say, uh, don't go out there and play anymore, right? So, so there's things like that. I'm kind of over them, protecting them, saying, hey, here's the direction I want you to go. Uh, that's about the closest illustration that I, th I can think of right now. Uh, but here he's saying that Jesus is, is Lord over us. That means uh, he is our total master. We are surrendered to him, and we are his servants. And then to say that, the, that Jesus is the Messiah, man, that's like an all-inclusive term saying that Jesus is uh, he's going to be the one to bring salvation to the world. He's the one that, is, that has been uh, hoped for and longed for, and he's going to bring complete victory over Israel's enemies, over God's enemies. He's going to be the one to fulfill the Davidic promises, all the promises of the Messiah in the Old Testament. He's going to be the one to sit on David's throne eternally and reign forever. He's going to defeat all the, all the enemies there are out there. And so he's making two very strong statements by saying that Jesus is Lord and the Messiah, but he makes a very strong proclamation. Friends, have you, have you uh, made that proclamation uh, in your own life? Have you, have you come to the point in your life when you said, you know what, Jesus is Lord of my life? Or is there still some internal struggle going on saying, I, I, I like uh, myself being in control and I don't want to give up a few things here. I don't want to make Jesus complete Lord of my life just yet. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you and I would urge you to completely surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Everything you have, everything you are, give it over to Christ. Let him be Lord, Master. Let him be Messiah over you. But here Peter, he gives this explanation of the gospel message. Friends, that's the good news. That's the, the best news you'll ever hear. In, in Tiberias, when I was there, I realized that people of all walks of life need Jesus Christ. We all need this gospel message. We all need the good news of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. If you're German, French, if you're an English-speaking person from the United States, from England, or uh, another part of Europe, if you're French or German, Hebrew, Arabic, it doesn't matter. We all need Jesus Christ. 
There's not a person in this world that doesn't need Christ. From all cultures, all ages, all backgrounds, all socioeconomic levels, we all need the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, just even uh, last week, I, I mentioned, or the last few weeks, I've mentioned a book that I was reading called Rangers in the Gap, and it's about a missionary who goes into Burma to help the Burmese people, uh, the ethnic groups there. And in the book, it tells different stories uh, of different people there uh, in the area. And it's kind of funny hearing their stories. Even though they may have a uh, vastly different culture, their story is the same. They're looking for riches, peace, wealth, protection, shelter, food, water, uh, and, and they don't realize that the main thing that they need is Jesus Christ. And every one of those stories, when they meet Jesus Christ, they find fulfillment in him. And I love that. I've never heard that same story over and over from people in Iran, from people in Kenya, from people right here in the United States, from Santa Fe, from Lamarck, my neighbors right across the street from me, right across the street here from this church. Friends, everybody needs the gospel story. It's for everybody. It goes, it is cross-cultural. It is, it is um, cross-generational. And, and one thing I remember being in that Tiberius church, I remember one thing I thought is, uh, man, we are all vastly different. Even the people in my group were vastly different. We had a man from Bethlehem. We had a guy from uh, Kosovo. We had a guy from uh, Argentina. We had some East Texans with us. And even, even in our group of East Texans, we were still radically different. Um, but we had one common thing between us all, one common denominator. Jesus Christ, the good news. We all had different backgrounds, different money statuses, different jobs, different uh, family backgrounds. But the one thing we had in common was the Lord Jesus Christ. That he was Lord over our life. He was Master. He was our Messiah. And here we have a similar situation going on. It's Peter standing up before all these people from different cultures, and he's taking this moment to proclaim the good news. And he's saying, everybody needs Jesus Christ. So friends, you need Jesus Christ. If you're listening right now, you need Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and if you have put faith in Christ, if he is Lord of your life, if he, if he is Master, you've proclaimed him as the Messiah, praise God, you have a reason to rejoice. He has saved you from an eternity in hell and separation from God. Praise God. You should be, right now, getting out of your chair, whatever you're sitting on, flipping it over and running out of the house because you're saved. It's an amazing, amazing thing. <laughs> so he gives the proclamation. He gives the explanation. Then look what happens next in verse 37. When they hear this, they heard the gospel message. They were pierced to the heart. I love that, that explanation. It's like the Spirit came in and convicted them. Uh, and, and it pierces them to the heart, and it's kind of a wake-up call to them that they are, they are living in sin, that they are sinful people, they are disobedient to God, they're longing for something, they're searching for something, and they can find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So they're pierced to the heart, the Spirit convicts them, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what, what should we do? So they ask him, what should we do then with this, this news? And so we have the proclamation, the explanation, and then we have the invitation. And in verse 38, Peter replies to them, and he says, this is, this is what you do after hearing the gospel message. You repent, and, and you get baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call, with many other wonders, uh, words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted this message numbered about 3,000 people who were added to the church that day. So he gives this invitation. So, so he makes a proclamation, gives the explanation, then he gives this invitation. This is what he says. He says, guys, this is, this is your next step. You've heard the gospel message. Here's your next step. Is, is you repent of your sins. Uh, you get baptized. And, and in that, it includes uh, putting faith in Christ. It includes making Jesus the Messiah Lord of your life. That's, that's what it is. That's the good news, friends, that Jesus loves us so much in our sinful state that he died in our place, paying our debt in full, was buried, rose from the dead. And if we have faith in that story, we, and, and having faith in that story involves repentance and, and obedience and baptism. And, and when we do that, we have salvation and we get filled with the Holy Spirit as believers in Christ. And friends, that is a great miracle of God. That's the greatest miracle. And I, I think we overlook that so many times. We say, oh, oh, Johnny, young Johnny got saved, woohoo, and, and then we move on. Friends, that is something to celebrate. When, when a soul, when someone puts faith in Christ, they are saved eternally. That means if they die, they are not damned to hell. They have the blood of Christ on them, and they get to go into heaven for all eternity in the presence of God. 
And I think we have lost the awesomeness of that, the, the true miracle of that, friends. Here are 3,000 people. They responded to the invitation given. They repented. They put faith in Christ. They received that salvation, the filling of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized. I would have loved to have seen how they did that baptism. I bet they were exhausted. Man, I don't know if they just went down to the pool of Siloam or uh, Zechariah's tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. I don't know, man, but they were, Peter was probably dunking all day long. You know? And I know a lot of churches these days give away shirts that say, I've been baptized. Or Can you imagine? Here's your, here's your baptism tunic, right? Put this on. You've been baptized. And then everybody walks around you know, with their new uh, baptism tunic on. I don't know, but that would have been an amazing scene because those people, their lives have been transformed forever. The Spirit fills them. Here's the amazing thing. They leave Jerusalem after this. Uh, Pentecost ends, they go home. These 3,000 people. Some of them probably live in Jerusalem. Some of them live all around Israel, maybe up uh, near Damascus. Some live in Crete and, and Rome and uh, Arabia, you know, Egypt, Africa. They, they begin spreading out. These 3,000 believers, they begin spreading out and taking with them the Spirit of God, the promise of the gospel message. They go, they go with the gospel message with them that Jesus that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's fulfilled all these promises. Uh, I bet that was amazing too. I bet God used that to bring other people to Christ. We don't know that for sure. The text doesn't say that. But what happened here was Peter told the greatest story. And friends, I want you today, if you're a believer in Christ, you believe that Jesus was born into the world, lived a perfect life, died on the cross in our place, paying our debt to God in full, was buried in, in, in that God raised him from the dead, completely defeating death, and in eternity in hell, and giving us salvation and a filling of the Holy Spirit, if you believe that, you have a reason to rejoice, friends. Then right now, I want you to worship God. And in a couple of weeks, when we come back together, we're going to worship the Lord. And it's going to be a holy and awesome time uh, to worship Jesus uh, together as a corporate body. But you have a reason to rejoice right now. If COVID was to make you lose everything, your job, um, <clears throat> your financial status, your cars, if whatever, if something happened to you and you lose everything, guys, I want you to know you still have your salvation in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the main thing that you need. Uh, because in this life, we take nothing with us except whether or not we believe in Jesus Christ. So if you have believed that Jesus is Lord of your life, he's master of your life, he is the Messiah, praise God, you have a reason to rejoice. Thank him right now for your salvation. If you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, maybe you're asking this question, what in the world is going on in this text? I want you to know, no matter what you've done, God loves you um, right now where you are. Listen, uh, all through the scripture, these dudes were messed up. These, these guys, these gals were messed up, man. Uh, Peter doubted Jesus. You go back and, and you see that Noah, he had a, a drinking problem. Moses killed somebody. David I had a woman's husband killed after he slept with her, and, and God still uh, brought some redemption to them and forgiveness to them. And so, friends, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you. Think about this. He was on the cross dying. One of the thieves on the cross called out to Jesus as Messiah. And he said, today you're forgiven. I'll see you in paradise in just a bit, in like, you know, three hours. So, no matter what you've done, friends, the Lord loves you right where you are. There's nothing you can, to be to, you can do to be more holy, nothing you can do to earn your salvation more. You can't read the Bible more. You can't come to church enough. You can't help enough old ladies across the street. You can't give enough. The only thing you can do is have faith in Christ. And that is where salvation and fulfillment comes, my friends. Have you made that decision to put faith in Christ? I want to invite you to do that. God loves you right where you are. He loves you so much that no matter how sinful you are, no matter what you've done, how disobedient to God we are, because we're all disobedient. I, I am chief of sinners. I've been disobedient plenty of times. But I know that God is good and he forgives us for our sins. What we have to do, just as, as Peter called them here, is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We have to believe, put our faith in Him, put our trust in Him. We have to confess Him as Lord and Messiah, repent of our sins, follow through eventually with baptism, and then we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we have salvation. Have you put faith in Jesus Christ today? I want to invite you to do that if you've never done that before. Call out to God, confess your sins to Him. Say, God, I am a sinner. I want to confess my sins to you. And I believe that God sent you to the earth you died, you were buried, you were raised from the dead. I believe in that story. Friends, you will have eternal life. So I want to invite you to make that decision. And hey, if you have questions about this, please reach out to us. Go to ArcadiaFBC.org and you'll find our, our, our contact information there, our phone number, our email. Email me, McDonald at ArcadiaFBC.org. 
You can find us on social media. Go to Facebook, type in Arcadia First Baptist Church, and, and boom, there it is. You'll see uh, all the contact information needed. If you have prayer requests, if you have theological questions, reach out to us. We may not be able to answer all those questions uh, just exactly. We may have to do a little research ourselves because we don't know all the answers, but, but we'll study it together. Uh, and, and especially if you've made a decision to put faith in Christ, reach out to us, let us know, because we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to help you walk through this journey. Uh, but you know what, guys? We have a reason to rejoice. No matter what's going on in the world right now, God loves us, and we have Jesus Christ. And friends, that's amazing. And so Peter made this proclamation, and I want to encourage our church people now to go and make the same proclamation to those around you, to your neighbors, when you're in the grocery store, wherever you're at, make that proclamation. Hey, I tried to share the, guy, uh, share the gospel with the guy at Taco Bell the other day, and he actually gave me some free tacos. So you know what? Hey, you never know what you get out of it. But I want to encourage you to go and share the gospel. We love you guys. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Our, our family, our staff misses you. Just to let you know, uh, probably in the next uh, few weeks, things may start turning back to, to a little bit more normal at, the, at, at our office. I, I, um, a couple weeks ago, I had some long things going on, so I decided to stay home, and, and the other staff did too, and, and rightfully so. And, and, you know, it's kind of crazy juggling uh, work and, and, and kids, and so uh, it may be a little hit or miss, but we're gonna, I'm going to try to be here a little bit more uh, and just to help answer the phones and answer emails and things. And so we're going to try to get to a little bit more normal schedule over the next few weeks. I don't know exactly what this looks like. Um, but we'll keep calling you guys. Please reach out if you have any questions, concerns, if you have thoughts, prayer needs. Uh, we can definitely call you and pray for you. Uh, I know a lot of you guys have done that. Uh, but just know, we are praying for you daily. We love you. Uh, before we end, oh, we're going to pray. And lastly, I just want to say thank you again for, uh, for tuning in today. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for this text. And, and Lord, thank you for the gospel message. God, how amazing are you, Lord? You are awesome. You sent your only son, Jesus, to die in our place. And not only did he die in our place, but he rose from the dead, defeating death uh, forever, God. If we have faith in him, we have eternal life. Lord, I pray today, as we've heard the gospel proclaimed by Peter, God, I pray that you would fill whoever's listening with your spirit, God. Convict them of their sins. Let them put faith in you. God, for those who are already believers, I pray that you fill them with your spirit and give them a reason to rejoice, God. Let them know that you are awesome and that you have saved them. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Hey, guys, you don't want to miss next week. We'll have Dr. Jim Grant here from the Galveston Baptist Association. So it's going to be a great conversation as we talk about missions and what's next for our churches with COVID-19. Thanks, and have a great day.